This sermon was preached at Jerseyville Baptist Church on February the 25th, 2024. It is entitled, You Shall Not Murder, and is the sixth sermon in our series on the Ten Commandments. For our first scripture reading uh, this morning, I'm going to read Exodus 2, verses 11 to 25. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he, Raoul answered his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zephorah to Moses in marriage. Zephorah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help um, uh, because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered the co his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Matthew chapter 5, I'll read verses 17 to 26. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary, who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. But truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Amen. This is God's holy word. The people of Israel were assembled at the foot of the mountain, waiting for Moses. Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments from God. They have witnessed the lightning and heard the thunder. God is present, and they are to listen and to obey his commands. Many years later, on another mountain, Moses was again present. This time, he was joined by Elijah, and most importantly, by Jesus. Jesus' glory was revealed as he was transfigured before his watching disciples. 
before Peter, James, and John. In the midst of this awesome scene, a voice came from the cloud that had appeared and covered them, saying, This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. This word from God, to listen to Jesus, was given not just to the three disciples, or to one nation, but to all people. The Son of God has come, and we are to listen to him. And he came not to reiterate the commands of the Old Testament, but to transform and to amplify them. And we see that clearly with the command that we are turning to this morning. As we continue our study in the Ten Commandments, we come to commandment number six. Thou shalt not murder, or you shall not kill. And as we have just read in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. In a sense, the people might have thought that the Sixth Commandment is the easiest one to keep. So many people don't have blood on their hands. They have not raised a knife or something and actually plunged it into someone. They have not murdered anyone. But Jesus takes this command and maybe makes it among the most convicting. Because as Jesus applies, thou shalt not murder. And we look at our own lives, and we've seen that, according to his definition, we have all committed murder. There are times when we have all been angry, when we have all said mean and cruel and hard things about other people, or where we have thought them in our hearts. This is one of those sermons that is going to be convicting and challenging. But when we think of our Lord Jesus Christ, we think of him as the lawgiver, the one who is the ultimate authority on what is right and wrong. But he is also the Savior. He is also the one in whom there is forgiveness. He is the one who, because we deserve death, came to lay down his life so that we might have forgiveness. And so we always need to keep that in our minds when we go through the texts, the commands that are particularly searching and penetrating and challenging and convicting that Jesus is the Savior. He is the one whose blood was shed so that we might be cleansed of our sins. Today we're going to begin by thinking about First, the command given. Thou shall not murder. In the society of God's people, there is to be no murder. The murder rate in Israel was to be zero. Murder is a premeditated and personal killing. It is premeditated in that it is something that is planned and is not accidental. The plans may be quickly devised, but it is murder when a person is attacked with the thought of taking their life. In the Old Testament, provision was made for how to handle accidental deaths. In our own law system, a distinction is made between first-degree murder, second-degree murder, and manslaughter. There's a recognition that causing an accidental death is not the same as murder. To be murder, there must be an intention to kill. Murder is premeditated, and murder is also personal in that the initiative to kill comes from an individual. And it is not done on behalf of the nation as either capital punishment or during a time of war. It is the decision and desire of the individual to take the life of another. And throughout the scriptures, there are many people who have committed murder. And we see that there are a host of motives that they have. The first murder in the Bible 
is recorded in Genesis 4 when Cain kills Abel. And the reason why Cain killed Abel was because of jealousy. He was jealous of his brother. He was angry that his offering, that Cain's offering, was not acceptable to God. The sin of pride in Cain's heart manifested itself in the murder of Abel. And then Moses. We read Moses murdered an Egyptian who was oppressing a Hebrew slave. Moses knew that he was called to lead God's people. And he was overcome with the injustice of seeing them oppressed. And so he rose and struck the Egyptian and killed him. But the reason why it was murder was because Moses took matters into his own hands. He was trying to lead the people and deal with the nation's bondage in his way, not God's way. David commits murder to save his reputation. After his affair with Bathsheba and the news of her pregnancy, he first sought to manufacture a circumstance whereby the people would think that the child belonged to Uriah and everything would be okay. But when that didn't work, he orchestrated Uriah's death in battle and took Bathsheba to be his own wife. Though David did not kill Uriah, by his own hand, the scripture makes it clear that his unlawful and heartless command to have him killed makes him guilty of murder. And one more example of a biblical murder is that of David's son Absalom, who killed his brother Amnon out of revenge. Amnon had defiled Absalom's sister Tamar, and though David the king knew about it, Amnon went unpunished. And the fact that he went unpunished was more than Absalom could handle. And so he took matters into his own hands and murdered his brother. There are all sorts of reasons that people have which lead them to commit murder. Rage, revenge, jealousy, a desire for financial gain, and even taking matters of justice into their own hands. In every situation, an individual died. The life of one created in the image of God was snuffed out. You shall not murder. And there would have been thousands upon thousands of Israelites throughout the generations who were aware of this command and kept it. They lived their lives. They worked hard. They provided for their family. They had good days and bad days. And eventually they died, never having killed another person. There may have been times when they were filled with anger or rage or jealousy. They may have known the desire for revenge. They may have even dreamed of or plotted the demise of someone. But they never put their plans into action. They did not actually kill anyone. They were law keepers, weren't they? When Jesus came on the scene, he taught the people that keeping the command is more than not committing the act of murder. It is about the heart. Our second point is the command amplified. Jesus taught like no one ever taught before. He provided a completely different paradigm for understanding the law and relating to God. The verse that we read earlier, verse 20, when Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That would have blown the minds of the people who were listening. In their understanding, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were the super saints. They were like so close to God. They were the ones that you were to aspire to. And for Jesus to say that your righteousness needs to exceed their righteousness... They would have thought that would be impossible. And then for Jesus to further say that if it doesn't, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven, also implying that their righteousness, this righteousness you think is so amazing, is not good enough for the kingdom of heaven. Jesus totally changed the game in terms of how they understood the law, how they understood relating to God, what they thought was expected of them. 
Jesus came and he taught them about the kingdom of God. He revealed to the crowd truths about the kingdom of God, how wonderful and awesome it is. You can read Matthew chapter 13, the parables of the kingdom, where again and again Jesus teaches them how beautiful and precious the kingdom is. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7, through 7, Jesus' focus is what the nature of the kingdom citizens are. The people who are part of God's kingdom. What are they like? And he says, they're not like the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the people that you esteem. The people who are part of God's kingdom, they're different. See, and what makes them different is they just don't have an external righteousness. Their commitment to God is not just skin deep. But they have a heart for the Lord. They seek God. Their passion is knowing Him. Those who are part of God's kingdom are not only those who do acts of external religiousness that is impressive, but they are those who are poor in spirit who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who put their trust in Jesus, those who build their houses on the rock, those who seek God. And because they love God, they strive to pattern their lives after him. Kingdom citizens have hearts that are tender toward God and his ways, and therefore hearts that are tender towards other people. The heart of one who knows the Father and the Son, whose priorities, who prioritizes the values and morals and ethics of the kingdom, will be full of love. God's kingdom is a kingdom of love. And those who are citizens of God's kingdom will be known as men and women and young people of love. And so when he addresses the command of not murdering in Matthew 5, Jesus says that restraining from killing someone is not enough. This command is broken if there is illegitimate anger or ridicule or name-calling. Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And you can see there are two parallel statements in those verses. First, there is the authority, where they have heard something. And then the second part, what they have heard. And then the two statements, the final part of the statement is, these individuals will be subject to judgment. And the first statement, Jesus says, that they have heard, you shall not murder. And this was a command given to people long ago. And though Jesus does not identify where the command comes from, the people all know that it is the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. You shall not kill. And those who murder will be subject to judgment. And the judgment is that the law says they will be killed. For example, Numbers 35, 30 and 31. Anyone who kills a person is to be put to death as a murderer only on the testimony of witnesses, but no one is to be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. They are to be put to death. And this was the crowd's understanding of the sixth commandment. They are not to kill. And if anyone does murder someone, then they are to face judgment. They are to be killed themselves. But Jesus does not leave the command as it is. He expands it. He says, but I tell you. This is what the law through Moses says. But now I am telling you something that you are to heed. Jesus is the lawgiver of the kingdom of God. He is clearly claiming authority to speak for God. No one is disputing the importance of the Ten Commandments. But what Jesus is saying is that the authority, the right, and the privilege to properly explain what the commandments mean is found in him. It is as if Jesus is saying to them, 
you think you understand what this commandment means. You think your religious leaders and the Pharisees understand what this commandment means. Well, let me tell you what it really means. What God really wants to see among his people. And Jesus says that those who are angry, some translations say angry without a cause, deserve the same punishment as those who murder. The inward sin, the inward attitudes that lead to murder makes an individual just as guilty in God's eyes as murder itself. And many of us have grown up being familiar with the Sermon on the Mount and with Jesus' words. And we maybe don't see how great an impact these two verses would have had on Jesus' listeners that day. He is telling them that the lens through which they understand spiritual realities needs to be transformed. You thought you understood what God expected of you and wanted of you, but your understanding was weak and shallow and superficial. The self-righteous, legalistic system of the Pharisees, which emphasizes and minutely examines behavior, is not sufficient. The religious leaders were all about behavior. As long as your external actions were pristine, God was happy with you. And what did Jesus call them? They are whitewashed tombs. They are whitewashed. Their outside looks really good, looks really impressive. These Pharisees, they prayed these beautiful prayers in public. They gave great donations. They fasted and let everybody know that they were fasting because they went around with long faces and looked disheveled and so forth. And Jesus said, they're whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside, but inside, they're dead. Inside, there's no life. Inside, their hearts are far from God. So what's the answer? To seek God. To have a heart that's transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have a heart that is transformed by Christ, then you'll understand that it's not good enough just to not murder someone. But you want to think of people with respect. You want to value each and every person. You want to be full of love. Obedience to the Lord means not only avoiding murder, but also avoiding anger. And as I said, some translations modify the word anger, adding without a cause to make it a little easier and a little clearer, easier to understand. See, Jesus was sinless, and yet he was angry at times. He was angry when people failed to glorify God. He was angry when people put obstacles in the way of others coming to him. In this verse, Jesus is talking about illegitimate anger. Anger that flows from our selfishness or our pride. And Jesus' point is that murdering someone in our feelings, our thoughts, or our words is just as serious in God's eyes as actually murdering them. Internally murdering an individual is equal to murdering in action. And Jesus further amplifies the command not to murder by saying, again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Raka is a word of contempt. If you say to someone, Raka, then you are declaring that they are worthless. There is to be no considering one another worthless or fools in the kingdom of God. That is not how God's people think and talk about each other. If you call someone names, you're not going to be arrested by the police, but the court, if you will, that you will be answerable to is the court of God. God will ask you why you felt empowered 
and emboldened to ridicule someone that he has created in his image. Calling names flows from a heart of pride. We feel justified for one reason or another in demeaning the object of our contempt. We murder them in our thoughts by arrogance, and we murder them in our words by abuse. And I don't think it's too bold a claim to say that we're all guilty of this. In fact, I suspect that these behaviors are such a part of our experience and what we see modeled in the world around us that there are times when we express anger or arrogance towards someone and we're not even fully aware of it. So what Jesus is doing is calling us to examine our thoughts our feelings, our words, in light of this truth. Let us not continue to murder in emotion, in thought, or in word. And as I said, this is a convicting word. This is one of those sermons that the preacher doesn't really want to preach because it's not just convicting, maybe for you, but for me as well. What this convicting word does is it reveals our need of a Savior. The law, the commands of God, are designed to bring sinners to a place of humility. They're designed to bring us to a place where we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus is the light of the world. And as the light of the world, one of the things that he does is exposes our sin. He reveals our sin. But then Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Those who mourn over sin. Blessed are those who recognize their sin and turn to Jesus for salvation. Blessed are those who realize that he is the way, the truth and the life. Jesus came and died on the cross so that we might be forgiven of all of our sins. And when we think of the the standards that Jesus says, we can be overwhelmed. And we realize how great our sin is. All of our sin, if we believe in Jesus, is nailed to the cross. Each and every one. And so, though this is a word that is convicting, it also reminds us of the sufficiency of our Savior. That when he died on the cross, all of the sins of his people were removed from us as far as the east is from the west. In Jesus, we have the forgiveness of sins. He took the punishment for our law-breaking on the cross. He died so that we might live. And in Jesus, we have strength to put sin to death. We cannot do this on our own. We cannot be devoid of illegitimate anger. We cannot remove the tendencies to think proud thoughts in relation to other people on our own. But the Holy Spirit sent to us by God helps us, works in us, transforms us so that we can be godly in our relationships and in our attitudes. The way of murder is not the way of Jesus. It is not the way of the kingdom of God. But what is? What is the way of Jesus? What is the way of the kingdom of God? For our next two points, we're going to think about two Christ-centered applications of this command. Do not murder. And the two applications are the Christian and love, and the Christian and life. Our third point and first application, the Christian and love. Jesus tells us that we are not to be angry, we are not to hate, we are not to be full of pride. Instead, the New Testament focus is on love. We are to love one another. Those who follow Christ will, like him, be characterized by love. Now, when it comes to the words hate and love, we need to define them a 
according to the scripture and not according to our society. Our society has its own definition and understanding of what love and hate mean. And more and more, their definitions are going further and further away from the scripture. The biblical understanding of love is that we cherish and respect others, seeking their good. Therefore, truly loving someone is not incompatible with rebuking them or seeking to correct them, because the most loving thing that we can do is to try and help someone walk closely with God. And hate is when you view someone with contempt. You belittle and demean them and hope for ill to come to them, not when you disagree with them. Believers are called over and over again in the New Testament to love other people. Our lives are to be saturated with love and to emphasize the truth that our lives are to be saturated by light, are to be saturated with love, we're going to do a very quick survey of some of the commands that we are given in the New Testament to love one another. Like, it's everywhere. All of the writers of the New Testament emphasize this. Jesus, in John 13, 34 and 35, says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So not only does Jesus give us this command, but he is the standard and example of the command. How are we to love one another? Like Christ. Like the one who was willing to give up his life for us. Paul. I think sometimes Paul thinks, people think of Paul as being, you know, not very kind, not very loving. He has maybe a bit of an attitude or an edge. He speaks a lot about love. Paul, Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. So the emphasis of Christian love is that it flows from a selfless, humble heart that seeks to exalt others. Then the next chapter, Romans 13, 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. So if you want to be a law keeper, well, then you're to love. Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. He says, in Christ, there is freedom. But how are we to express our freedom? Not by indulging the flesh, not by doing whatever we want to do, not by saying, well, if in Christ there's forgiveness for my sins, then therefore I can just keep on sinning. There's no, guess what you're free to do? To love, to serve, to exalt one another, to bless people. Ephesians 4.2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul is clear. We're to love one another. And so is Peter. 1 Peter 1.22 Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. And then chapter 3, verse 8 of 1 Peter. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Likewise, James writes, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. That's James 2, 8 and 9. And then, of course, if you're familiar with John's writing, John is the apostle of love. And there's so many verses from 1 John that reiterate the command to love one another. 1 John 3.23, we'll just do two examples from 1 John. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. In, John, in John's mind, believing in Jesus is linked to loving God's people. If you do not love others, then it is questionable whether you truly believe in the Son or not. That's John's understanding. That's how central the command to love one another is. 
for the Christian. If we believe, then it just flows from us. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved us so much that he died on the cross. If we are in relationship with the Father, who loved us so much that he sent his Son, then we will love one another. And then 1 John 4, 7, Dear friends, let us love, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. We are to love. And we see in these verses what the scripture means by love. It involves devotion and honoring other people. It means being humble and gentle and patient. It is the opposite of indulging in the flesh. Indulging the flesh, allowing our minds to think fleshly about others, leads to bitterness, anger, and hate. Thinking godly about them leads to love and motivates us to pray for them. We are to love. We are to love our friends. In the passage in Matthew 5, we are not to be angry or speak ill of our brothers or sisters. Our community of faith is to be a place of deep, sacrificial, Christ-like love. If you look back to those verses, uh, verses 21 and 22 in Matthew 5, he specifically says, if you're angry with a brother or sister, if you say to a brother or sister, raka, or fool, so in that context he has in mind, the community of faith, how we talk to other believers. And how are we to love one another? Well, Jesus exemplified love for his friends by washing the feet of the disciples. Jesus, the Son of God, humbled himself by taking the place of a servant, the lowest of the low, and washing the disciples' feet. And at the conclusion of that powerful act, he told them to go and do likewise. We are to honor others above ourselves. And Jesus showed us that there is no expression of love or service that is too demeaning, that is too far below us. Because he took the position of a servant and washed his disciples' feet. And if you were there, he would have washed your feet as well. And we are to follow his pattern. We are to love our friends. And we are to love our enemies. If you slide down in Matthew 5 to verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There are people that it is easy for us to love. That love for them just sort of comes naturally. But there are other people that it's hard to love. And what sets us apart from the world, what sets Jesus' followers apart from the world, and from the attitude of the self-righteous, is when we love our enemies, when we show respect, when we want to see good to come to those we disagree with. And Jesus is, again, the perfect example of one who loved his enemies. He prayed, Father, forgive them when he was dying on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for his enemies. And there was a time when we were his enemies, when we didn't recognize him. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I hope none of you have enemies. I hope there is nobody that when, we, when you hear that phrase, love your enemies, that you think, oh yeah, that's my enemy. I hope none of you truly have enemies. But there are probably people that rub you the wrong way, that you struggle with, coworkers, people who have come across your path, people who you need to maybe take an extra breath after you've had a conversation with them or whatever. We're called to love them. So when we think about what sort of application the command, do not murder, has for us today, it teaches us that we are to be zealously pursuing Christ-like love in all of our relationships and toward all people. We are to follow the pattern of God the Father 
and God the Son. We are to love. And then the second application, the Christian and life. And I want to think about another way in which this commandment intersects our lives and our society. And that is the area of life. We are not to murder. When you murder, you think low of the value of human life. The believer, those who follow the Lord, are to think highly of human life. Human life is to be valued. This is an unmistakable biblical teaching. Life is to be valued because all people have been created in the image of God. When God created male and female, he created them. He created us in his image. And of course, the image has been tarnished by the fall. We are not the image bearers that we are supposed to be. But the image is still there. And the biblical teaching is that every individual is to be valued because they are created in the image of God. In the covenant that God made with Noah, he said, And from each human being, too, I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Now, at one level, that may sound contradictory. That if someone kills someone else, then they in turn should be killed. Two wrongs don't make a right, do they? The reason why a murderer is to be killed is because they have done a terrible act because the one they have killed is an image bearer of God. Imagine a scenario where you are mad or upset at someone. In your anger, you deface a picture of them, drawing nasty additions to their face. Or maybe you simply cut them out of a photo. How you treat the image of that person shows what you think and how you feel about that individual. I'm not going to go home and deface a picture of someone I love. How we treat people, the image bearers of God, shows how we view God. James highlights this point in James 3, 9 through 12. With our tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, We curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He says it's inconsistent. It doesn't make any sense that if we with the same tongue praise God, and then curse God's image, a person made in his likeness. Each and every human being is an image bearer of God, and to destroy the life of an image bearer is to raise a hand not only against the individual whom God has honored, but against God himself. It is a rebellion of the most serious kind, and that is why God said, back in Genesis 9, that if an individual murders another, then they are to be killed because they have raised their hand against God. And what that makes clear is that all human, all human life is to be valued and treasured. And how does this principle of the value of human life affect some of the social issues of our day? And I'm, these, are, these are issues and concerns that we could spend a lot of time on. And I'm just going to briefly mention a few thoughts. Um, and this is in no way a, com- a complete conversation about um, these things. But when we think of the value of Christian life, then it affects the Christian and racism. And quite simply, Christianity is incompatible with racism. We are not to show favoritism. Jesus was sent to the people of Israel, but nonetheless, time and again, he ministered to people from other nations. And then the commandment that he gave as he returned to heaven 
was that his followers were to go to all the nations to make disciples. God's people were to be a light to the world. And that's not even just a New Testament thing. In our Bible studies on Wednesday night, we've been going through uh, Solomon's life, the early chapters of 1 Kings. And 1 Kings 9, there is such an emphasis there on the nations. And Solomon in his prayer says that this temple that has been built is to be a light to the nations. And if they look at the temple and pray to God, then he asks that God would accept them. Solomon understood that. God has a heart for the nations. And of course, the promise to Abraham that through him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God has a care for all people people from every tongue, tribe, nation. And if we have the same heart as God, then we will not judge people on their background. Then any form of racism will be driven from us. And then the Christian and abortion. The biblical teaching is that all people are equal and valuable. We are all created in God's image with a purpose. And what undergirds many of the worldly positions on these issues is that not all people are of equal value. There is human life, and then there is subhuman life, or lesser human life. And the baby in the womb, in the worldly understanding, is not human life yet, and therefore not deserving of the same rights and protection. When we as eager parents want to find out the gender of our precious baby, we were told with a flat voice, it definitely is a male fetus. Now that statement was technically accurate. Robbie was at that point a fetus. But fetus is also a term used to divorce the fact that even at that moment, Robbie was also a human being, a baby. His heart was beating. His blood was flowing. His legs were kicking. He has been given dignity and value by his creator, who was knitting him in his mother's womb. The biblical, por- the biblical position on abortion is that we seek to care for all human life. We care for the life of the precious baby in the womb who is defenseless and cannot speak for him or herself. And we care about the life of the mother, many of whom are going through crisis, who are probably confused and scared and who needs help and support, and who does not need to be encouraged to make a decision that may very well cause physical and additional emotional agony. The Christian loves life. And then the Christian and euthanasia. And this is an issue that is more and more front and center in our society. Euthanasia means good death. It is the practice where an individual can legally hasten their death with assistance. In 2016, euthanasia became legal in Canada. Since then, 45,000 Canadians have been assisted in ending their lives by healthcare professionals. The number of people who select this option is increasing 30% per year. And this is a stat that I found shocking. In 2022, 4.1% of all deaths in Canada were under the banner of MAID medically assistant in death. That's one in 25. When it was first proposed and brought into law, the objective, we were told, was to prevent a sufferer from facing a painful death. Only those who had terminal conditions could apply. And now the laws have been expanded to help people with certain conditions avoid living a painful life. And the most recent proposed expansions to the law, which have been delayed for now, would include making MAID available to those who have mental health issues. 
And don't miss the shift that has happened. Initially, only those who were terminally ill, whose death was imminent, would qualify for MAID. But in only a few years, the scope has been broadened. Now it is proposed as a solution to help those with physical disabilities and eventually mental health issues avoid living what has been defined for them as too hard or too painful a life. As those who love life and who see value in all life and who believe that all human beings are image bearers of God, we weep and we pray. Raka means to call people worthless. And what is someone who struggles with mental health supposed to think when the government wants to make provision for them to end their life because of their great suffering, if they so choose? What is the message that they receive? Is the message they receive that they are valued and treasured? Or is the message that they receive that they are expendable and even worthless? Some of the stories and accounts and reports that we hear of, of what is going on in our country are terrifying and distressing. The waiting period for MAID is in many cases shorter than the waiting period for social assistance or medical help that desperate people need. It is well documented that some people consider MAID not really because they want to end their life, but because they are overwhelmed by financial pressures or a fear of not being able to get help when they need it. And instead of seeking to help, what is being done is to make euthanasia part of the normal fabric of our society and also of our medical system. We are devaluing the life of those who qualify for euthanasia. And when we do so, we devalue all life. And as believers, we have a different understanding of suffering. The world will tell you that suffering is to be avoided at all costs. When we read the scriptures, we read that suffering has a purpose. And that's not to speak lightly of suffering. Suffering is suffering. It's hard. It's brutal. I can't fathom when Sean shares about Benjamin's family and the grief that they are going through. But the scripture helps us make sense of suffering. And the scripture teaches us that the most horrific act of suffering that has ever happened on this earth is the means by which we are saved. The greatest act of injustice was when the Son of God died on the cross. Suffering is a reality. But we trust that God has a purpose in all suffering. And when we suffer, it should draw us closer to Him. The things of this earth are fleeting and temporary, even our health. But God is eternal, and we look forward to being with him. Death is not an appropriate solution for the suffering or hopelessness that a person is dealing with. We are not to encourage, support, or help people to self-murder. The solution for their hopelessness is Jesus Christ. It comes back to Christ. We need Jesus. Our society desperately needs Jesus. He is the one in whom there is hope and peace and love. He is the one who brings comfort to the sufferers. When the Christian reflects on the command, you shall not murder, we should be challenged. We should be challenged to show love and not be characterized by anger, hostility, pride, or contempt to others, as Jesus showed radical, selfless love to all 
even to his enemies. So are we. And we are to be challenged to value life, the lives of all, and to be prepared to give a reason why, why we find life so precious, why these things matter. And life is precious because it is given by God. And because we, because all people, are his image bearers. And the brokenness of our world, of humanity, and of individuals should drive our anticipation of the world to come. In heaven, we will be like Christ, for we will see him as he is. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is definitely a heavy topic. And it's hard in so many ways. It's hard when we think of the implications of do not murder for our own relationships. When we see the standard of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are not to be angry, that we are not to call names, that we are not to speak about other people with contempt or pride. And our Father, forgive us for that. And then when we think of uh, do not murder, and we realize how our society does not value life as you do. And that causes us to weep. And our Father, we pray. We pray for those in government. We pray for the decisions that are made. We thank you that the proposed expansion of MAID has been postponed for now. And our Father, we pray that it would be permanently taken off the shelf. And our Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom to know how we should conduct ourselves in conversations. And our Father, we pray that you would that you would cause there to be a revival. That people who are hopeless, that people who need direction, would find Christ as the anchor of their souls. Bless our Father, we pray in Jesus' name.